On the 1st of February 1921, the US Navy released a specification for a single-engine torpedo seaplane. The result of this competition would shape the course of US naval aviation and of world history. Purchases of combat aircraft were few and far between in 1921, and the Navy requirement was hotly contested by five aircraft companies. The new Davis Douglas Company, operating from an office behind a barber shop in Los Angeles, California, Donald Douglas's former employers at Curtis, plus Stout, Fokker, and Blackburn. This was only Douglas's second aircraft under his own name. The first was the Sol Cloudster, a somewhat innovative long distance pleasure aircraft. He based the DT-1 on the Cloudster, but shifted to mixed wood and metal construction. The fuselage had a welded steel frame with aluminium skin. The tail structure was also steel, but fabric covered. The wings, which folded for shipboard storage, were fabric over a wooden frame. DT-1 was a single-seat, open cockpit design with the cockpit quite far back, behind the wing trailing edge. The engine was a 400 horsepower water-cooled Liberty V-12. This mighty engine's packaging and cooling requirements resulted in the DT's characteristic slab-sided appearance. Wooden floats were fitted for on-water operations, and a single torpedo could be carried in a recess under the fuselage. It was a good design, and in April 1921 it was selected as the winner of the on-paper stage. Three single-seat prototypes were ordered, alongside three sets of wheels for on-land operations. Built in the Goodyear Blimp factory in Los Angeles, the first DT was completed in October 1921. Trials were done within December, identifying one major problem. The Navy pilots believed that safe operations required a two-man crew. The second and third prototypes were therefore modified with an observer's cockpit behind the pilot. The pilot's cockpit was moved forward to make this possible, and a 30 caliber machine gun was fitted on a flexible mount for defensive purposes. Two of the prototypes had been destroyed in pilot-induced accidents by July 1921, but fortunately for Douglas, the last survivor completed its acceptance trials and briefly served with Torpedo Squadron VT-1. As a two-seat float plane, it weighed 4,500 pounds empty, about 150 more than the single-seater. It was 7,300 pounds at full load. Floats added 800 pounds. Although lightweight by modern standards, it had quite a large footprint. A 50-foot wingspan and a chunky 37.5-foot long fuselage. Elegant, it was not. Top speed was a blazing 101 miles an hour. Climb rate was a very sedate 400 feet per minute and the ceiling 7,800 feet. Maximum range was good though, at 293 miles. Additional weight resulting from the addition of the second seat meant installing a higher compression 450 horsepower Liberty, and in turn this meant adding more cooling and a redesign of the nose to include larger radiators. Making all these changes meant that the final acceptance of the DT-2 wasn't made until January 1923. But the Navy had already seen enough and it ordered 35 production examples, which had started to be delivered in 1922. Because of the way that aircraft production was arranged in the early 1920s, the contract was split such that Douglas made 18 in Santa Monica, the Naval Aircraft Factory in Philadelphia built 6, and the Dayton Wright Company in Ohio the final 11. The first batch was followed by another batch of 20 from Douglas and 20 from the Low Willard Fowler Engineering Company of College Point, New York. Different engines were tried in the DT-4, which had a 650 horsepower Wright T-2, the DT-5 with a T-2B, and the 450 horsepower radial engine D-6. The 650 horsepower versions added about 5 miles an hour to the top speed, and more significantly they doubled the speed at which the aircraft could get to 5,000 feet. But the fundamental soundness of the DT-2 meant that it was the main version. Five squadrons of them served with the Navy from 1922 to 1928, on the 2nd of May 1924, a DT-2 carrying a torpedo successfully launched off the USS Langley using catapult assistance, the first time that such a combination had been attempted. Equipped with wheels, DT-2s became a regular part of the air wing alongside Vought VE-7 fighters, becoming the first naval bombers to operate from a US carrier. In this role, it was armed with the 17-foot-long, 1,600-pound Bliss Levitt Mark 7D Mod A torpedo. This was an evolution of the Mark 7, 43 aerial drops of which had been made from 1919 onwards. 
plenty of experimentation had been required. Initial drops from 30 feet damaged the torpedoes. Eventually, the optimum airspeed was determined to be between 50 and 55 knots at a height of 18 feet. The Mark 7 torpedoes were modified by strengthening them for shock, installation of an exploder safety pin and the attachment of a nose drogue resulting in the Mod A and its variants. With the new DTs entering service, the Navy decided to conduct an exercise to show the effectiveness, or otherwise, of a mass torpedo attack by aircraft against manoeuvring ships at sea. So on the 27th of September 1922, the battleships Arkansas, North Dakota and Wyoming moved into position 50 miles off the Virginia Capes. As they made good speed in calm seas, they were attacked by 18 DTs from Torpedo Squadron VT-1, which had flown 90 miles from their base at Hampton Roads. The battleship steamed in formation. Arkansas, the principal target, had stationed observers at key points around the vessel to watch where the planes dropped their practice torpedoes. The DTs flew at an altitude of about 2,000 feet and then swept in to release their weapons at distances of between 500 to 1,000 yards during a 25-minute attack. As they observed the drops, the battleship's lookouts telephoned the bridge and the navigator attempted to swing the ship hard over. It was a confusing melee, happening at far greater speed than even the fastest of destroyer attacks. Arkansas successfully dodged three of the torpedoes, while a fourth hurtled past her and accidentally impacted North Dakota. Nevertheless, the plane scored eight hits on Arkansas. Subsequent analysis emphasised artificialities which prevented the practice from demonstrating the combat capabilities of either the battleships or the torpedo bombers. Even so, the bombing runs demonstrated the capabilities of planes to launch torpedoes and of the weapons to run straight. Later tests on the later Mark 7 Mod 5A showed that its upgrades had raised drop speed to 75 knots and height to 32 feet, making the planes harder to hit by any defensive fire. Nearly 20 years later, in the afternoon of the 7th of May 1942, another Douglas product, the TBD Devastator, from Lexington and Yorktown, dropped to wave top height into the teeth of the Imperial Japanese Navy's guns. Making their runs, they scored seven hits on the carrier Shoho. Dauntless's hit her with 13 bombs. She sank. The next day, Devastators launched somewhere around 20 torpedoes at the Shokaku and Jukaku, but this time without success. Even so, the era started by 18 ugly, slow biplanes over the Virginia Cape had reached its peak. The DT itself was long gone in US service by this point. Constant exposure to salt water and the punishing impact of landing on the sea or on a carrier deck had rotted the wooden frames, corroded and cracked the steel. They were retired in 1928. Remarkably, the last DT-2s were in operation as late as 1940, in the hands of the Norwegian Naval Flying Service. There's no record as to whether they were used when Nazi Germany invaded, but regardless, their longevity is a tribute to the same design that launched Douglas as a force to be reckoned with in US aviation. <laughs>